Amen. The Apostle of Ireland. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have also some videos we're going to be using uh, later this year, but uh, it's drive through history is going through the Bible. And, and then after the Bible, drive through history is taken from uh, the, the uh, church expanding from Jerusalem and, and tracing how Christianity has spread to every nation in the world. And so Dave takes us to different places, and so he's going he's gonna to talk about St. Patrick today. I've just got a clip of that, but he's the Apostle of Ireland. And the name of this series from Drive Through History is To the Ends of the Earth, which is what Jesus said. Go preach uh, this gospel. Let's go read this real quick. Matthew 28, Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. And so that's what St. Patrick did. He went to Ireland. And I'm Irish and German and Swedish, uh, a mixture of, thing, of things. I, I, was, I went to a restaurant in, in Czech one time as a missionary, and the waiter said to me, he said, what are you? You, you are American. You are mutt. <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, all right, well, can you bring the food? I'm hungry. <laughs> Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have. So next week we're going to have a baptism. And, uh, you know, in the book of Acts also, uh, Jesus told them, uh, preach the gospel. Go to, to, to Jerusalem, to Judea, to, to Judea and to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so the story of St. Patrick is uh, a part of that story. So go ahead and show this video. Patrick was born in Roman-controlled Britain in about 390 A.D. But it wasn't long before barbarians from across the Irish Sea raided British coastal regions, taking many captives. Patrick was probably 16 years old when his village was attacked. He was taken captive here to the rugged shores of Northern Ireland, and he was sold as a slave shepherd to a local Druid chieftain. He was forced into bitter isolation, tending flocks as a slave shepherd here on Slemish Mountain. As Patrick faced his first months of loneliness, hunger, illness, and despair here on Slemish Mountain, he began seeking God. He later wrote, I would pray constantly during the daylight hours, and the love of God surrounded me more and more. After six tough years in this area of Northern Ireland, totally relying upon God, Patrick wrote that he had a life-changing dream. The message, your hungers are rewarded. You are going home. Look, your ship is ready. So Patrick snubbed his fear of punishment, left his flocks, and walked 200 miles to the Irish coast where indeed he found a ship. Patrick the fugitive traveled back over the Irish Sea to Britain. There he joined a monastery and dedicated the next 20 years of his life to pursuing God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. After becoming a priest, Patrick couldn't deny his heart for the Irish people and his calling to return to them. At this point in history, about 432 AD, Ireland was dominated by full-scale barbarism. Nonetheless, Patrick wrote, I am ready to be murdered, betrayed, enslaved, whatever come my way. He had to return for the Irish people that he loved. Patrick planted his first church in a barn in Northern Ireland. He went on to spend the next 30 years of his life preaching the gospel all around the treacherous island. In the end, Patrick is credited with baptizing 120,000 people and founding 300 churches in Ireland. St. Patrick's Cathedral here in Dublin is a fitting tribute to his incredible legacy. With the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD, it looked as if paganism might again get the better of Christianity when new adversaries, the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes 
invaded Britain. Yet against the odds, Christianity survived. Missionary activity continued here in Ireland, and starting with Scotland, an Irish evangelist named Columba brought Patrick's style of Christianity to mainland Britain. 100 years after Patrick, Columba was considered the next great evangelist from Ireland. In 563, he put together a team of 12 missionaries and he traveled north across these treacherous waters to Western Scotland. And he founded a monastery on the Isle of Iona. Iona Abbey became the focal point for spreading the gospel in Scotland and is considered one of the oldest centers for scriptural study in Western Europe. Iona Abbey is still home to a Christian religious order and remains a popular pilgrimage site. During the decades following Columba, followers of the Columba movement continued planting monasteries throughout Ireland and Scotland. Despite growing pressures, the gospel continued to spread. Over 2,000 years ago, the man known as Jesus of Nazareth was born in the small town of Bethlehem. So that's exciting. And uh, put, put up the map there, Aaron, of the, uh, the Roman Empire. After, uh, there we go. So that shows the, the Roman Empire in the uh, 5th century, which is the 400s. So, so Patrick may have been born in the late, uh, 300s comes he comes back to Ireland like he said around 4 432 uh, and so Ireland's up there to the left of of Britain it wasn't in in the Roman Empire it was uh, a barbarian and uh, so St. Patrick's Day is coming up March 17th which is the day, which is the day uh, he died and uh, so for a lot of people, though, St. Patrick's Day is, okay, wear something green if you remember. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe get a clover or, uh, and so there's more to St. Patrick's Day than wearing green, which, first of all, it's, it's, it's a holiday that, that celebrates Christianity in Ireland, the fact that Ireland became a Christian nation. But here's a holiday that, the, that is celebrated the whole world over to some degree, but it's about remembering an apostle who preached the gospel to a whole nation. That's a holiday we're celebrating. Come on. Right? So, uh, so Patrick, now he wasn't Irish. He's a native of Britain, which was in the Roman Empire, and his father was a deacon in the church, and his grandfather was a preacher. But he was like, that's not for me. I got a life to live. I got money to make. I got people to meet, right? Uh, I got things to do. And, uh, but when he's 16 years old, there are raiders from, from these barbarian, and the, the Roman Empire is declining. So these Irish raiders come to Britain and are kidnapping people for slaves. And so they, they think, you know, Ireland thinks, hey, let's get some people. They'll take care of our flocks for us. We don't have to work. But, but Patrick, uh, he is responsible, along with others, for converting the Irish people to Christianity. And like he said, in the course of his ministry, he is said to have baptized more than 120,000 people, founded more than 300 churches, and, and ordained other ministers. And so Columba, who then goes and preaches the gospel in Britain, and he's Irish, he's a... He's a uh, uh, from the legacy, a, a disciple of the Christians as the result of Patrick's preaching, right? So isn't that cool? So he died around 465 AD, March 17th, and uh, he's called the Apostle of Ireland. And uh, Ireland was uh, filled with, uh, there, were, there was not one united king. That doesn't happen till later in Ireland, but there's these territories of these, of these, and there's two big classes of people that are the nobility, these kings, but then there are these Druid priests who advise the kings, and uh, we're going to tell you about those in, in a little, uh, few minutes here. But Ireland 
begins to impact all of Western Europe with its Christianity throughout church history. It still one uh, has some of the most uh, ancient manuscripts of the Bible. Like if, if you want to go study ancient manuscripts, Ireland is one place to go. And so there's the Book of Kells that comes from Ireland. And so Irish Christians were, were copying manuscripts way back there, right? And, and so Ireland has sent missionaries all over the world. And so there are two Latin uh, documents that survive, which are generally accepted as having been written by St. Patrick. They are the, his confession and his letter to the soldiers of Caroticus, who was taking slaves. And so uh, St. Patrick, he had a crusade against slavery. So that's pretty cool. And so there's a legend, some, there are some things that are legends of St. Patrick that really aren't, uh, like one of them was that he chased out all the snakes from Ireland. And, and there are no snakes on Ireland, uh, but there may never have been, which is crazy because you would think somebody would bring a pet snake <laughs> and let it loose and then there would be snakes. Anyway, <laughs> but... Um, but, but I believe really what that stems from is sometimes there's a, a, there's a kernel of truth there. Uh, so there may not have been physical snakes there, but, but he chased out all the false paganism, the snakes that, uh, of spiritual snakes that were there that he, he cast out of that nation, right? So that's really cool. And so driven them out into the sea, it, it was said. And... Uh, so he's a, he's a humble missionary, and his writing about himself, he's, he's very humble in, in uh, describing himself as uneducated, and, um, but he evangelized Ireland, and he used, as a slave in Ireland for seven years, he knew the Irish culture, he knew the Irish language, so he preached in their language, he, he, he knew what they believed, he knew what their culture was, and he used that. And can you, so it's just a powerful story that, here he was, a teenager, made a slave in Ireland. He got the opportunity to, to escape, and he received a dream and a vision from the Lord that said, your ship is waiting, and he's out of there. He, so he escapes, and then 20 years later, after he's been dedicating his life to the gospel, he has an, a, another vision. And this Irish lad comes to him and says, we want you to come... <sighs> and walk with us again. And so he goes back to the nation, that it, it, the people that enslaved him and loved them and preached the gospel to them. Whoa, what a powerful story. So he, he has enormous courage. Uh, and so he set in motion a series of, of events that impacted all of Europe. And... Uh, so Latin writings from about the mid-third century make frequent reference to raiding expeditions uh, that were carried out by the Irish who were, uh, so they were coming to Britain and, and taking slaves back to Ireland. And so he's a 16-year-old Romanized Briton. Patrick was sold to a cruel warrior chief whose opponent's heads sat atop sharp poles around his palisade in Northern Ireland. As a strong message, you know, don't try and escape. So Patrick became a shepherd, and so he was taking care of his master's sheep, kind of in isolation, secluded on Schlemis, Schlemis, uh, Mountain. And now he was not a Christian, although he was familiar. He, he had heard the gospel, but he'd never acted on it. He'd never committed himself to Jesus. But while he's a slave, while he's watching the sheep, he says... Uh, he now turned to the Christian God of his fathers for comfort, and he said, I would pray constantly during the daylight hours. The love of God and the fear of him surrounded me more and more, and faith grew. He became a Christian while he's a slave in Ireland. And the spirit roused so that in one day I would say as many as 100 prayers, and at night only slightly less. So this is what he wrote. He said, I, Patrick, a sinner, a most simple countryman, the least of all the faithful and most contemptible to many, had for father the deacon Calpurnius, son of the late Potitus, a priest of the settlement Vicus of Benevem Tabernae, 
he had a small villa nearby where I was taken captive. I was at that time about 16 years of age. I did not indeed know the true God. And I was taken into captivity in Ireland with many thousands of people, according to our deserts. For quite drawn away from God, we did not keep his precepts, nor were we obedient to our priests who used to remind us of our salvation. He became the slave of Milchu, the king of Dalaradia, the commencement of whose reign, the four masters assigned to the year 388. So um, the earliest St. Patrick could be born would be 372. Um, it, so this kingdom was a, was a powerful kingdom in northeastern Ireland and uh, to the hill of Slemish. And uh, he said this, but after I reached Ireland, I used to pasture the flock each day and I used to pray uh, many times a day. So isn't that cool? Because later on, he's going to pastor the sheep of Ireland, Amen. the people, right? More and more to the love of God and my fear of him and faith increase and my spirit was moved so that in a day I, I, I said a uh, hundred prayers before daylight to pray in the snow in icy coldness and rain and I used to feel neither ill nor any slothfulness because as I now see the spirit was burning me at that time. He said, in my sleep, I heard a voice saying to me, you do well to fast. Soon you will depart for your home country. And again, a very short time later, there was a voice prophesying, behold, your ship is ready. And it was not close by, but as it happened, 200 miles away where I had never been nor knew any person. And shortly thereafter, I turned about and fled from the man with whom I had been for six years. And I came by the power of God who directed my route to advantage. And I was afraid of nothing until I reached that ship. And on the same day that I arrived, the ship, see, he's, he got a, th this, this voice from the Lord, this vision, and, and he's responding to it. He's obeying it, but he still f he faces resistance and obstacles. When he gets to this ship, he says, take me uh, to Britain, and they say no. And uh, so the ship was setting out from the place, and I said that I had the wherewithal to sail with them, and the steersman was displeased and replied in anger sharply, by no means attempt to go with us. Hearing this, I left them to go to the hut where I was staying, and on the way I began to pray. And before the prayer was finished, I heard one of them shouting loudly after me, come quickly, because the men are calling you. <laughs> right, they, they, didn't, they said no, and he started praying. Then they said, hey, Come on, you can come. And immediately I went back to them and they started to say to me, come because we are admitting you out of good faith. Make friendship with us in any way you wish. And after three days, we reached land and for 28 days journeyed through uninhabited country. And, the, and I think they landed in France and, uh, and the food ran out and hunger overtook them. So now they're, they're, they're hiking, <laughs> trying to find civilization and they're out of food and they are hungry. And he's been preaching the gospel to these people. And so the steersman began saying, why is it, Christian? You say your God is great and all-powerful, then why can you not pray for us? <laughs> for we may perish of hunger. It is unlikely indeed that we shall ever see another human being. You know, when you get hungry, you start to get hangry. <laughs> and you start to get a little dramatic. It's like this, this guy needs a Snickers. <laughs> He's like, we're never going to see another human being. <laughs> You're a Christian. You say this God of yours is all powerful. Why don't you pray? <laughs> and uh, in fact, I said to them confidently, check this out. Be converted by faith with all your heart to my Lord God because nothing is impossible for him so that today he will send food for you on your road until you be sated, satisfied, because everywhere he abounds. Yeah. And with God's help, this came to pass, and behold, a herd of swine appeared on the road before our eyes. Come on. So they ate good, more, you know, so they were satisfied. Can you imagine? I mean, these hungry people, and there's, he's outnumbered. You know, they could start to think ill of him. So he said, he said confidently, I mean, this takes some real faith to say, God is going to provide food for you. Amen. Commit yourself to him. Yes. <laughs> I love it. So now after he's been in the ministry, he's training for the ministry. So 20 years later, and he's back home in Britain. 
He says, in a vision of the night, I saw a man whose name was Victoricus coming as if from Ireland with innumerable letters. And he gave me one of them, and I read the beginning of the letter, the voice of the Irish. And as I was reading the beginning of the letter, I seemed at that moment to hear the voice of those who were beside the forest of Foclut, which is near the Western Sea. And they were crying as if with one voice, we beg you, holy youth, that you shall come and shall walk again among us. Wow. And I was stung intensely in my heart so that I could read no more, and thus I awoke. Thanks be to God, because after so many years, the Lord bestowed on them according to their cry. So I'm going to show you in the Bible where something similar happened. Paul the Apostle uh, is, is going across the world to preach the gospel to other nations. In Acts 16... Verse 6, it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. So the Lord is leading them. Don't go there. How many of you know he's got a place where you're supposed to be? A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So this happened in the Bible, and then this happened for Patrick. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So Patrick did the same thing. Now, his fellow ministers in, in, in Britain were like, no, 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 don't go to Ireland. There are barbarians there. They'll kill you. So they, he didn't have a lot of support to go do this. And Patrick was, was as fully convinced as the, the Celts that the power of the Druids was real, but he brought news of a stronger power. And so he wrote down his famous lorica, and that means uh, armor. And so it's Patrick's breastplate, prayer, spiritual warfare prayer, a prayer of protection, it expresses perfectly Patrick's confidence in God to protect him from every fierce, merciless force that may come against my body and soul. We're going to pray that in a few minutes. He said this when he goes to Ireland to preach the gospel, and, and, and so the, the Druids were against him, and actually they wanted to kill him. And so he faces off, he has challenges uh, against these Druids, and they're the ones advising the king, so he has the kings trying to kill him. But he gets some kings saved too. And actually, his former slave owner becomes a Christian. Isn't that amazing? So he said this, he said, I dwell among Gentiles, uh, which that word again means those who don't know God. He wrote, uh, in the midst of pagan barbarians, worshipers of idols and of unclean things, daily I expect murder, fraud, or captivity. But I fear none of these things because of the promises of heaven. I've cast myself into the hands of God Almighty who rules everywhere. Wow. Now, uh, one of the greatest enemies he, he saw happening was slavery. He was one of the earliest Christians to speak out strongly against the practice of slavery. I mean, so this is in the 400s where he's speaking out against slavery. Scholars agree he is the true author of a letter excommunicating a Br British tyrant, Caroticus, who had carried off some of Patrick's converts into slavery. So these are Irish people he's led to the Lord, and here this Britain guy is coming over and taking them slaves. So they're, th they're taking each other's slave. <laughs> And so he wrote a letter, hey, release my Christians. <laughs> release your slaves you've taken. Uh, so he said, ravenous wolves have gulped down the Lord's own flock, which was flourishing in Ireland. He wrote, and the whole church cries out and laments for its sons and daughters. He called Caroticus's deed wicked, so horrible, so unutterable, and told him to repent and to free the converts. It's a, it's a bold letter. And uh, now we don't know if, uh, if he did free those slaves, but within his lifetime uh, or shortly thereafter, the entire Irish slave trade had ended. Wow. 
So, like I said, his his Irish mission was uh, unpopular to his fellow clergy in Britain, and so the, he got criticism, and he responded with his confession, where he's telling his testimony and his commission by Jesus Christ to go there and preach the gospel. Uh, now, it's said also that St. Patrick used the uh, the uh, sh- the shamrock, the the, the clover, the three leafed. Uh, shamrock is a symbol to explain the Trinity. And so often St. Patrick, when he's pictured, he'll be holding uh, a three-leafed shamrock. Because, so these are, the Celtic, uh, they're polytheists. They worship all kinds of uh, things and gods. They, they believe in mul- many gods. And so he says, no, there's one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, they go, they go well, that's more than one. And so he, he said, hold up that shamrock. And he says, how many shamrock, how many is that? He said, uh, and so he was teaching them how one God in three persons, as he would uh, follow Matthew 28, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he would challenge them to hold up a shamrock and challenge his hearers, is it one leaf or three? And they said, it is both one leaf and three. And so he said, so is God. And there we go. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so, so there's a picture of a, a three lo- three leaf cl- clover. Now that's so God is not exactly like a, a shamrock, but He was able to communicate to them something could be one and three. So He said this. He said, "I am ready for Him to grant me that I drink of His chalice." Remember when uh, the apostles had said, we want to sit on your right and on your left. And, and, and he said, can you drink from my cup? Can you drink from my chalice? And, and, and he said, you will. And, uh, and part of that means to suffer for him. And uh, I am ready for him to grant me that I drink of his chalice as he has granted to others who love him. Therefore, may it never befall me to be separated by my God from his people, the Irish, whom he has won in this most remote land. Like there were people saying, come back, get out of there. And, he, and, and so he had a, a God-given love for the Irish people that he died there and was buried there. He said, I pray God that he gives me perseverance and that he will deign that I should be a faithful witness for his sake right up to the time of my passing. And he said, and if at any time I managed anything of good for the sake of my God, whom I love, I beg of him that he grant it to me to shed my blood for his name with proselytes and captives, even should I be left unburied or even were my wretched body to be torn limb from limb by dogs or savage beasts. Or were it to be devoured by the birds of the air, I think most surely were this to have happened to me, I had saved both my soul and my body. In other words, I don't fear what somebody could do to me because I have salvation from the Lord. For beyond any doubt on that day, we shall rise again. So he had a confidence in the resurrection that the apostles preached. On that day, we shall rise again in the brightness of the sun, that is, in the glory of Christ Jesus, our Redeemer, as children of the living God and co-heirs of Christ. Wow. Made in his image. For we shall reign through him and for him and in him. He said, for the sun we see rises each day for us at his command. In other words, he's saying that the fact that you see the sun rise each day at God's command is a a, a picture or a prophecy that you are going to rise at his command. But it will, it will never rain, the sun, neither will its splendor last. But all who worship it will come wretchedly to punishment because people would worship the sun. We, on the other hand, shall not die who believe in and worship the true son, Christ, who will never die. No more shall he die who has done Christ's will, but will abide forever just as Christ abides forever, who reigns with God the Father Almighty and with the Holy Spirit, before the beginning of time, and now and forever and ever. Amen. So these are things Patrick wrote down, and and even, I mean, we can see his faith expressed in what he said. Look at this psalm with me, Psalm 67. God, keep us near your mercy fountain. 
his mercy fountain and bless us. And when you look down on us, may your face beam with joy. Send us out all over the world so that everyone everywhere will discover your ways and know who you are and see your power to save. See, this is what Patrick did and Christians have been doing throughout church history. And even today, uh, we have friends that, that are in Ukraine and Poland. And uh, so thank you so much for giving. We, we're, we're sent more than $500 to help uh, people in uh, Ukraine and Poland. Verse 3, let all the nations burst forth with praise. Let everyone everywhere love and enjoy you, God. Then how glad the nations will be when you are their king. They will sing, they will shout, for you give true justice to the people. Yes, you, Lord, are the shepherd of the nations. No wonder the peoples praise you. Let all the people praise you more. Uh, like a million hallelujahs. The harvest of the earth is here. Wow, the harvest of the earth is here. James in the New Testament says that God is like a farmer waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. The harvest of the earth is here. God, the very God we worship, keeps us satisfied at his banquet of blessings. Today we're going to have a banquet of shepherd pie blessings, but there's all kinds of blessings, right? Uh, And the blessings keep coming. Then all the ends of the earth will give him the honor he deserves and be in awe of him. I love it. So, so Patrick faced opposition, like even to get on the ship to get out of there and then to get some food to survive their hike uh, in, in Western Europe. And then as he comes back to Ireland, he faced obstacles, resistance, and sometimes even hostile. And so he faced uh, a lot of opposition from the Druids who practiced magic. They were skilled in secular learning. They were advisors to the kings. And uh, the biographies of the, of the saint are, are filled with stories of Druids who wished to kill St. Patrick. And so also the Roman historians write about the Druids. Uh, the Greco-Roman and the vernacular Irish sources agree that the Druids played an important part in the pagan Celtic society. In his description, Julius Caesar wrote that they were one of the two most important social groups in the region uh, alongside the nobles and were responsible for organizing worship and sacrifices, divination, and uh, they were the judges, uh, so judicial procedure in Gaelic, British, and Irish societies. So the, the Druids were the judges, they, they were the, the philosophers, they were the counselors, they, they uh, governed sacrifices, and now their sacrifices were also included human sacrifice. He wrote that they were exempt from military service and from paying taxes and had the power to excommunicate people from religious festivals, making them social outcasts. So these were powerful people. And uh, some other classical writers, Diodorus, Siculus, and Strabo, wrote about the role of Druids in Gaelic society, stating that the Druids were held in such respect that if they intervened between two armies, they could stop the battle. So those people wanting you dead could, yeah, you know, that could be not a good thing. So another one, uh, Pomponius Mela was the first author to say that the Druids' instruction was secret and took place in caves and forests. So they, they would spend like 20 years learning to become a Druid priest. And so Greek and Roman writers frequently made reference to the Druids as practitioners of human sacrifice. Uh, Caesar says those who had been found guilty of theft or other criminal offenses were considered preferable for use to sacrificial victims. So if you were a criminal, you know, if you were arrested, you could end up being sacrificed to the gods. But uh, if they had a lack of sacrificial victims, anyone will do. And of course, they didn't have like... uh, Bill of Rights, they didn't have, you know, a peer of your, a jury of your peers, innocent until proven guilty. You know, somebody could not like you and you could be, end up a, a, a sacrificial uh, victim. So when criminals were in short supply, innocent people were acceptable to sacrifice. And so Caesar recorded one form of sacrifice. They had more than one. 
But one form of, of sacrifice recorded by Caesar was the burning alive of victims in a large wooden effigy, often known as a wicker man. So they would build this hollow wicker man and fill it with people and light it on fire. Yeah, disgusting. So the, this is what Patrick faced when he goes to Ireland. And these Druid priests didn't like him because he's, he's challenging their authority. I mean, if he's successful, it's over for the, the, the Druid priests and their uh, paganism. And so uh, human sacrifices, uh, Julius says, involving criminals were more acceptable to the immortal gods, though when supply was short, the innocent would also be sacrificed. Uh, during this discourse of Celtic uh, human sacrifice, Caesar provides one example of the way the Druids carried out this task, which this involved this uh, wicker man of vast size, and they would fill the limbs with people. Um, wow. So Diodorus Siculus also said that a sacrifice acceptable to the Celtic gods had to be attended by a Druid, for they were the intermediaries between the people and the divinities. So, I mean, their reputation is we speak for the divinities and we're, we're the connection of you to the, the divinities, like to give you fortune or to, to protect you. And so he remarked, they, were also, they would also divine the future. And so he said, these men predict the future by observing the flight and calls of birds and by the sacrifice of, of animals and orders of society are in their power. And in very important matters, they prepare a human victim, plunging a dagger into his chest. By observing the way his limbs convulse as he falls and the gushing of his blood, they're able to read the future. In other words, he bled that way, he fell that way, so that means... So that, that is, that's demonic. Like the Bible condemns that kind of thing to try and tell the future by how, uh, by how people's organs fall out. Anyway... So there's archaeological evidence from Western Europe that has been widely used to support the view that Iron Age Celts did practice human sacrifice. They found mass graves found in a ritual context dating from this period. And uh, so Diodorus Siculus wrote in around 36 BC, he described how the Druids followed the also what they believed, the Pythagorean doctrine that human souls are immortal, immortal and after a prescribed number of years, they commence a new life and a new body. So reincarnation was also a teaching. So St. Patrick comes in preaching something completely different. Uh, life is valuable, created in the image of God, you know, and he's the one who tells us the future. So let me give you some other quotes by St. Patrick. He said, so I live among barbarous, barbarous tribes, a stranger and an exile for the love of God. So he started out as a teenager, just living for himself, became a slave, finds freedom, and becomes, by his own will, his own decision, a love slave of God. To love God and to love people and become uh, a servant of God, like the Apostle Paul says. He said this, he said, if I be worthy, I live for my God to teach the heathen, even though they may despise me. Wow. So Hebrews 12 comes right after Hebrews 11, which tells us the hall of faith in, in biblical history of all the people who trusted and believed God. And, and then in Hebrews 12, the apostle says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. In other words, the cloud of witnesses is made up of these people who've gone before. They're a cloud of witnesses that have testified of Jesus, of, of God. And, and, and now they also witness uh, our life here on the earth. And so he says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now he just went through telling about the acts of faith of people in Hebrews 11. And, and, and so that, that is continuing to this day of people who are recorded in heaven in their activities of faith, right? And, and so we are to remember, we're, we're to to look at their lives and see an example there. Uh, so not only in Hebrews 11, the, the biblical people that he tells about, but also people like St. Valentine or St. Patrick or Polycarp or Stephen, you know, all these people who committed themselves completely 
to God in, in courageous faith. So therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured hostility from sinners against himself. That's the same thing that Patrick is saying. He endured hostility against himself. lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. So one of the things also that's discouraging to us is when, when God corrects us. When we, we're, we're trying to mind, we're doing our own life, and then we read the scripture and it says, this is the way, you know, like, ugh. You know, at first it might have been a battle for Patrick to go back to Ireland, you know? When he got that vision, he could have been going, that's the last place I want to go. <laughs> but he became obedient to that heavenly vision. And so he says, my son, do not despise the chastening, or that just means disciplining, and he's a father. So there are some things that people think of as God's, cha but isn't. But anyway, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him or corrected by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, uh, in other words, all of us need it, right? Then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful at the present time when it's happening, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. All right, so this is the Lorica of St. Patrick, and that word Lorica means uh, body armor. And this is what he would pray as he's going to preach the gospel and has Druid priests uh, putting out the wanted posters for him. <laughs> and, and he was successful. And, of course, you know, the more successful he got, then the more the Druids wanted to get rid of him. So, uh, so this is uh, Christian uh, spiritual warfare prayer. And so I'm just going to go through it, and then we're going to pray it together. I arise today through God's mighty strength the invocation of the Trinity, right? The Bible says, whoever calls upon his name uh, shall be, will not be put to shame, shall be saved. Through a belief in the threeness, through a confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth and his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion and his burial, through the strength of his resurrection and his ascension, right? And the Bible says we are seated with him. And in Romans 6, he talks about the fact that we are risen with him in baptism in his resurrection. So he's going through our identification with Jesus in his redemptive work for us through the strength of his resurrection and his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. He condemned sin and won victory over Satan and the kingdom of darkness, whereby we are given authority, right? Right? So in other words, he's, he's saying we receive God's strength through his judgment of evil and, and of the devil. I arise today through the strength of the love of cherubim. So angel, angels that serve God, who the Bible says minister for those who are heirs of, the, of salvation, right? In obedience of angels, in service of archangels. In other words, the angels are, are protecting, they're helping me, Psalm 91, right? in the hope of resurrection to meet with reward, in the prayers of patriarchs. How many of you know that, the, that every prayer by every Christian, uh, in Revelation we see the prayers around the throne of God? Amen? And so in the prayers of patriarchs, in preachings of the apostles, in faiths of confessors, you know what that means? Those who confess their faith upon threat of death, 
like St. Valentine, Polycarp, who, who confessed their faith in Jesus and then were killed for it. That's the faith of confessors. In innocence of virgins, in deeds of righteous men. I arise today, so he's reminding himself of, of this legacy of faith that we uh, receive uh, and when we're in Christ, when we're in the church. I arise today through the strength of heaven. We're already citizens of heaven. Be strong in the Lord and in his might. Light of the sun, right? So, so the, the God who created the sun, who gives its light, he, God is light, right? So he's going to give you light. Splendor of fire. So like, like Druids believed in this, this, these powers in these natural things that God created. Like the God who created everything that we see is powerful, you know, he made it. He's actually more powerful than that, but he gave that its power. And so is there power in fire? Oh, yeah. Speed of lightning, right? Swiftness of the wind. Jesus is the one who commanded the wind, and it was peaceful. Depth of the sea, stability of the earth. And there's lots of scripture that talks about the earth will not be moved, right? Firmness of the rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me. He says his ear is open to your cry, right? God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me from snares of the devil, from temptations of vices, from everyone who desires me ill, afar and near, alone or in a multitude. That would even cover a conspiracy, right? I place today all these powers between me and evil against every cruel, merciless power that opposes my body and soul. So this is what St. Patrick is praying when he's, he's facing up to these Druid priests and kings who wanted to kill him. And so they're cursing him. So when the Romans first came uh, to Ireland and Britain, Britain, it freaked them out because these Druids were out there with their hands raised up cursing them and, and calling down curses on them. And, and the Romans were like, we haven't seen that. That's weird. <laughs> against every cruel, merciless power that opposes my body and soul, against incantations of false prophets, against black laws of pagandom, against false laws of heretics, against craft of idolatry, against spells of witchcraft and smiths and wizards, against every knowledge that corrupts man's body and soul, Christ, shield me today. Against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding, against illness, so that reward may come to me in abundance. Christ with me. Christ before me. And uh, then he finishes again like he started. And so let's go ahead and uh, let's stand up. And let's just pray this together. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through a belief in the threeness, through a confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth and his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion and his burial, through the strength of his resurrection and his ascension through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. I arise today through the strength of the love of cherubim, in obedience of angels, in service of archangels, in the hope of resurrection to meet with reward, in the prayers of patriarchs, in preachings of the apostles, in faiths of confessors, in innocence of virgins, in deeds of righteous men. I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of the sun, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of the wind, depth of the sea, stability of the earth, firmness of the rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, 
God's host to save me from snares of the devil, from temptations of vices, from everyone who desires me ill, afar and anear, alone or in a multitude. I place today all these powers between me and evil against every cruel, merciless power that opposes my body and soul, against incantations of false prophets, against black laws of pagandom, against false laws of heretics, against craft of idolatry, against spells of witchcraft and smiths and wizards, against every knowledge that corrupts man's body and soul. Christ, shield me today against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding, against illness, so that reward may come to me in abundance. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of every man who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strain, the invocation of the Trinity through a belief in the threeness, through a confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. You feel encouraged even after having just said that? Yeah, right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Lord. So as we just went through that, some of you today, you might be on joining us on a live stream, or you might be here, and you know what? I actually have never committed myself to Christ. And maybe you've grown up in a Christian family like Patrick did, but he never followed Christ himself personally until he became a slave. And then he called out. He called upon the Trinity. And he became a Christian. And his life changed history as he gave it to the Lord. And so you may never have done that like Patrick did. And so I want to invite you to do that because God loves you. And you are important to God and you're important to us. And your life matters. St. Patrick also said this as he's preaching the gospel. He said, he who believes shall be saved. Whosoever believes shall be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord, we shall be saved. So he said, he, shall, he who believes shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be damned. God has spoken. So I want to invite you to pray with me these words on the screen. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word says, Him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So I know you won't cast me out, but you take me in, and I thank you for it. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. You said in your word that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus, I'm calling on you right now. I am poor in spirit. I need you, and I humble myself in your sight. Lord Jesus, I want to receive and experience your mercy today. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, that you were raised from the dead on the third day, and you're alive right now. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you now, reveal yourself to me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent all of my sins and surrender myself totally and completely to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me in your precious blood. You also said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I believe in my heart 
Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he was raised from the dead for my justification. And I confess, Jesus, now you're my Lord. I receive your gift of life. Live your life in me and through me. Heavenly Father, by faith, I now confess Jesus Christ as my King. And from this day forward, I dedicate my life to serving him in the kingdom of God. I'm calling on your name so I know you've saved me now because your word says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness and I do believe with my heart. I have now become the righteousness of God in Christ and I am saved. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead, Christy. I don't want anyone else. I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. You are my one thing. I don't want anyone else. I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. You are. So Paul said, I count everything as loss to know Jesus. And so this week, you put on some green on Thursday, March 17th, and, and somebody says, Happy St. Patrick's Day. You can say, hey, do you know who that is? <laughs> do you know what he did? Do you know why we're celebrating him today? A lot of people don't know. And so you can tell them about the apostle of Ireland. And I'm Irish 
and I know Jesus, and I'm thankful. And so I'm thankful for St. Patrick, and uh, it's a great opportunity. So St. Patrick's Day is a great opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, Amen. right? It's a, it's a Christian, it's a day to celebrate a, a missionary and apostle that preached the gospel, and, and, and it's, a, it's a holiday everybody knows about, except, you know, they, they don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we're going to pray uh, over our food. Uh, we're going to go next door, eat some really good food, and have some good fellowship. So, Father, we thank you for this food that uh, the people of our church have made. Thank you, Lord, for the, they've created it in love with creativity and good ingredients. We ask you to bless them, and we thank you for all you've provided. In Jesus' name, amen. We bless you with the love of God and the grace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. He's with you wherever you go. Amen.